Hi everybody and uh, thank you for joining. I'm Simon Hills, Technical Specialist with the International Labour Organization and um, co-chair of the Child Labour Task Force within the uh, Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. And I'll uh, hand over to uh, my co-chair to introduce herself. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks again for joining this. There you are. I knew it that would happen on this session. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, so hi, everybody, again. Uh, and thanks for joining this session. Uh, my name is uh, Ilenia De Marino, and I'm the co-lead of the Child Labour Task Force together with Simon. And I work also as a deployable CPI specialist at Plan International. So um, just quickly today, as you know very well, is the World Day Against Child Labour. And uh, you know, what better occasion to put the spotlight on this uh, issue that, uh, as we all know, is affecting many countries and communities around the world. We hope that this, this session will give you some uh, food for thoughts. We will have a Q&A session at the end, but um, you know, please, please feel free to use the chat to ask the questions in the chat. I would monitor uh, the chat and also collect the questions to ask to our panelists. And now I, I will um, pass it back over to Simon for a quick message. Thanks, Elenia. So um, just to kick things off, as, as Elenia has mentioned, today is World Day Against Child Labour. But um, just to get us all participating and thinking, we've got a couple of questions uh, within uh, Mentimeter, if the uh, link can be posted in the uh, chat. So we have, uh, where are you joining from? Where in the world are you joining from? Is child labour a problem where you work or where you live? Do you think the issue of child labour, alongside other child protection issues, are being satisfactorily addressed or given su sufficient prominence? Excellent, so we are getting literally people from all around the world. This is very good. So Yemen, Switzerland, Brazzaville, Brazil, Kenya, UK, Uganda, Nepal, Venezuela. Okay, excellent. We really have got a diverse uh, group of people joining, which is good to see. Do we have any of the results for the other questions or are we going later? So, yes a bit for 19, yes quite a problem for 44. So for the majority of you, say that child labour is a problem where you work and where you live. Next slide. Uh, do you think the issue of child labour being satisfactorily addressed, and uh, that is a uh, resounding no from the majority of you. And then the final slide. Well, that was it, okay. All right, then without further ado, let us introduce you to uh, our panelists who are also joining us from uh, around everywhere as well. So our panelists for this session to talk about uh, child labour, the centrality of child labour and child protection, and also uh, social justice, which is the theme of this year's World Day Against Child Labour. We have uh, Sandra Mainyant, uh, the CAFAG advisor at Plan International and co-league of the uh, CAFAG task force. We have Ruba, who is a child labour activist, accompanied by uh, Fatima Adat of uh, TDH, who is uh, joining us from Lebanon. And we have uh, Saleh Hamad, the Child Protection and GBV Specialist for Plan International in Jordan. Okay, so let's start with our first set of questions then. So, um, Ruba, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, your situation, what you've been facing, some of the challenges and, and what that means for you? Hello, everybody. I hope, Frank, that you are doing well. Uh, thank you very much for this nice and amazing session. Uh, I'm Rubo Ali Dejuma. Uh, I'm 17 years old, a senior resident in Lebanon. I'm a volunteer in uh, TDH. 
um, and uh, I work uh, in a supermarket for around uh, nine uh, hours daily and uh, a, a private teacher uh, that I start uh, this uh, since uh, uh, 2020. And um, one of my hobbies is uh, painting. And this event, I uh, want to shed light and uh, highlight uh, the most critical uh, trouble and the problem in Lebanon, which is the child labor. Uh, since the child labor is, uh, is increases uh, in Lebanon due to many social and uh, economical troubles, uh, that's why children is obligated in order to be able to work. Uh, these things uh, allow children in order to be able to cost uh, a lot, such as the private children from uh, uh, many uh, main rights, uh, for example, playing, learning, uh, development, uh, childhood, and many other. Also, uh, when uh, the children is work uh, like uh, in uh, in street and many other places that uh, the children is work, it uh, will expose to many uh, the problems such as the violence and exploitation. Okay, thanks, Ruba. Um, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, Sandra, if I can come to you quickly. We've heard from Ruba of some of her experiences in Lebanon in terms of child labour and given the conditions faced and the hours worked, it could be argued it's definitely one of the worst forms of child labour, but to come to another form of worst form of child labour on CAFAG. Um, this is obviously a child protection uh, concern. Um, peace is obvious obviously another important goal in conflict situations. So how can addressing CAFAG as a central issue within say child protection or humanitarian situations help achieve this? Uh, and are there any examples you could give? Thank you, Simon. Yeah, so like when it comes to CAFAG, so children associated with armed forces and armed groups, um, a complete intervention includes the prevention of recruitment and use, the facilitation of release, and then the reintegration of children. So when we work on prevention, we seek to address the risk factors of recruitment, which can be, among other things, a conflict in the community. And uh, so, for example, in Nigeria, there are some youth-led organizations who organize interfaith and community dialogue to promote social cohesion and to reduce hate speech. So that's an example of how um, they managed to reduce a risk factor of recruitment in addressing um, conflict in the community. Then and when CAFAG exit a non-group or a non-force, they go back to their community and they often face a very hostile environment. And that's particularly true if they were associated with armed groups that are perceived as the enemy. So often there are two sides and then if they were on the wrong side, then they will be perceived as perpetrators of violence, people will be scared of them. And so part of a reintegration program will then focus on social cohesion. So then we need to work with the community and with also the children to promote peace and then to really establish a safe environment for them. And we have some good experiences uh, from various countries. I'm thinking about Colombia, where they established a national reconciliation and traditional, and traditional justice program. And with that, they organized a national historical memorial center, and they also established an observatory of memory and conflict. And the purpose of these were to collect testimonies of CAFA, collect their perspective on the conflict and also suggestions of what needs to change. This was also an opportunity for the communities who were affected by conflict to also share their perspective, make sure people were not forgotten. So these are like some examples on how we can bring all actors around the table and, um, and transition from conflict to peace. I'm also thinking about South Sudan, where former CAFAG have been trained on community level peace building and conflict resolution to overcome conflict and, and become agent of change. So with this approach, the idea is that we empower children, we give them the skills so that they're part of the solution and no longer part of the problem. So they're a key player in the peace process. Thanks, Sandra. 
And then um, Saleh, to go to you, from your work in Jordan, uh, what are your thoughts on, on how the overlap between child labour and child protection takes place? Yeah, thanks, Rahman. Yeah, and yeah, actually, for me, the overlap between child labour and child protection uh, occurs because child labour, at the end of the day, it's uh, or it's a violation of children's rights and poses significant threats and well-being. And for sure, it's affect the ability to attend the regular school uh, and mentally, physically, socially uh, harmful uh, uh, for the children. And child protection, on the other, other hand, focuses on safeguarding uh, children's uh, rights and ensuring the, their well-being, safety, and development. And uh, I think there are uh, three key points highlighting the overlap. Uh, one, it's uh, the exploitation and abuse, because the child labor often involves in uh, hazard work conditions, such as uh, long uh, hours or uh, low pay or physical or uh, emotional abuse. And, uh, uh, and, it's, you know, and this is not in line with the uh, principles of child protection because the child protection at the end of the day, it's aimed to prevent uh, harm and ensure uh, children's safety. Uh, the second point is education and development because the child labor uh, can uh, prevent children from accessing education uh, in their uh, educational progress. And child, uh, child protection recognize uh, education uh, 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 and the mental rights for children. And it's very important uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the children because uh, the future opportunities. Uh, and I think because uh, engaging in child labor, uh, uh, children uh, are denied the chance to learn and grow. Uh, and its impact on uh, their uh, well-being overall. The last point is the health and well-being, because the, at the end of the day, child labor, uh, uh, severe implica uh, uh, implications for children, physical and mental uh, health. And I believe because we in Jordan faced some uh, uh, energies uh, on children because uh, they, they are engaged in worst form of, of child labor. And this is uh, the main concept of child protection because it's um, at the end of the day to promote safeguarding children and uh, 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 health and well-being uh, uh, in general. Uh, for me, uh, addressing the overlap between child labor and child protection required holistic approach through engaging laws and policies and uh, per habit child labor, promoting access to quality education, rise, uh, raising awareness about uh, children's rights and uh, providing support uh, uh, services for uh, vulnerable fa families and livelihood opportunities for the families and to stand on the roots of, uh, of uh, child labor uh, uh, cases. And by recognizing uh, the uh, connection between child labor and child protection, efforts can be yani, direct towards eliminating child labor. And I believe this is the aim of uh, such amazing uh, webinars or conference and just to unify the efforts and to highlight the, the gaps uh, in the child protection and child labor uh, field. Excellent, thank you, Sally. I think you touched on a number of very interesting and relevant points. Uh, Ruba, um, to pick up on what Sally was saying as well about the overlap in the three sort of areas, how, how much of the, um, what he mentioned in terms of the three points, in terms of the exploitation, abuse, and hazards of work, the impact in education, and then the, the, the need for sort of um, the, the impact of child labor in terms of physical, mental health, and, and safeguarding. How much of that sort of rings true for you, and can you sort of bring your personal experience to, to confirm or, or, or question as well? Okay, child labor has uh, a very big effect on uh, on uh, very field uh, like education, like health, and many other. So, according to the education, uh, I obtained that uh, there is no balancing between uh, work and education. Since I worked uh, around nine hours, and uh, this uh, 
uh, will be very difficult in order to make a balance between work and uh, education. Uh, that's why in education, I uh, get a very low grade, but uh, more and more, I can able uh, to make a balance between work and uh, education, but a little bit, uh, and sometimes I cannot able to make education when there's exam. So there's uh, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, stress, depression, and uh, many other uh, troubles I face. Uh, so uh, there is no balance between work and education. And according to the health, um, first of all, uh, because I'm 17 years old and uh, my uh, body cannot able to uh, lift uh, a lot of uh, heavy objects, uh, that's why yeah, in the work uh, I was implicated in order to be able uh, to um, in order to be able to stay uh, in order to be able to lift uh, a very uh, uh, a very object that is that has a large size. That's why I feel a weakness in my span. Also, a very a very work a very hours that uh, I have worked uh, for around uh, nine hours. This uh, is uh, a very long uh, work time. So I feel uh, very tired and uh, a stress and depression. And uh, also, uh, if uh, there is no correct work, uh, the supervisors advisors start uh, to beat me and uh, shout on me. Uh, that's why I feel uh, a lot of stress and depression. Has there been anything which uh, you, which has been provided that has helped you through this? Can you repeat again? Yeah, you're saying about the stress and depression and, and the difficulties, but I know with TDH and others, um, what sort of services and what sort, going again to the sort of children's rights and services Saleh mentioned, is there anything that's been provided to you which has helped you through this and sort of helped with, as Sandra said, about empowerment as well? Yeah, uh, the organization, uh, TDH organization, helped uh, me and play a vital role in order to can able uh, to release uh, depression and stress. It helped me in two sides, uh, economical and uh, psychological. Uh, psychological, uh, I start to attend awareness campaign with uh, TDH uh, that uh, make awareness campaign in order uh, to raise self-confidence, uh, reduce depression uh, and uh, case uh, management also with the, the PSS and uh, many other uh, many other session that's related uh, to my case also economical it start uh, to get uh, to get us uh, a money in order to be able to supply the necessary needs like food uh, education uh, uh, or uh, school installments uh, and uh, to buy clothes and uh, many other things thanks Riva um no very interesting to hear and, and again it seems that the, that your answers show in practical terms the, the the challenges the difficulties the harm that child labor does uh, and as well as the need for the, the services that uh, Sally mentioned um just to move on quickly i see we time is ticking but is in our favor so i have a question from the audience for you sandra um, someone would like to hear from uh, you some of the best practices on how child labour has been tackled in conflict affected countries. Do you have any sort of experiences how these have dovetailed and you've seen how this has happened? Mm. So, I mean, my field of expertise is more on CAFAG. So, of course, this is what I can speak of. Um, and there are, and yeah, I've seen also in the chat that there is often an increase of child labor more generally, not only on CAFAG, in countries affected by conflict. Uh, when I worked in uh, Syria, for example, we saw how children were um, engaged in various forms of labor, um, some of them like the worst form of, of child labor. Um, they had to distill fuel on the side of the roads and things like that, things that were extremely dangerous. And um, what I've noticed there is that it was it was very difficult because the families were really looking for the extra money that the children were bringing. And um, and it was like a lot of advocacy with parents to show them the negative impact of um, of work on the, the health of their children. So we had situations where children were severely burned, for example, when they were working on this like distillation of fuel. Um, and, and that was really um, 
when parents realized how dangerous it was and how it was in the end not worth the extra money uh, to risk the health of the of their children. So, and now you know, gradually working with the community, community leaders to really also share that information with people in the camps was was very helpful. So I think the health side was a was a good way to advocate to parents and then to children that this was really not the best idea and direct them to alternative options and with education in particular. And then um, Sally as well, hearing from Sandra in the situation in terms of needing social support, or as we would say in the ILO, social protection, looking at a wide range of things, be it cash transfers, actual um, social protection system set up by the state or more informal networks and, and means of providing either support through money or, or provisions to those who need it. Um, we had a question looking at um, Guatemala and the issue of uh, labour informality and how that feeds into uh, child labour and also um, the need for programmes um, that provide social support to parents as, as they themselves uh, encourage child labour, as, as Sandra mentioned. Um, do you think um, some of the experiences you've seen in Jordan relate to that as well? And, and you can provide some sort of context and, and examples as well. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah, I mean, actually, in Jordan, I mean, as I mentioned before, we we follow the holistic approach of intervention, especially in in the child labor sector. That's why we are working with individuals, with the children themselves, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, some of child labor cases they need uh, uh, specialized services such as. Um, mental health or uh, health uh, services. That's why we we follow the uh, uh, the referral system in Jordan. And on the other hand, with children's, we we offer uh, uh, life skills for protection uh, sessions and uh, PS, uh, uh, focused PS sessions. This is the first layer. The second layer, we are working directly with parents and parenting for protection programs, just to make sure they, they are understanding the uh, the impact of uh, of child labor on their children and. Uh, to know more about the uh, effect of uh, child labor in general on the health, education, and etc. cetera. Uh, at the same thing, we are working directly with parents uh, through the referral, uh, to refer, uh, through refer, uh, referring them to livelihood opportunities because yani, the main uh, uh, cause of sending their children to uh, child labor sector because yani, they mentioned the, uh, uh, the economic situation for uh, some families in Jordan. That's why we, we uh, uh, try our best to engage them in child labor uh, and uh, livelihood opportunities. The uh, third layer, uh, Simon, is yani, working with uh, uh, community uh, through our community committees. That's why we are creating community committees in, uh, in, inside the, uh, the camps, refugee camps and uh, host communities, just to make sure you know, this community leaders uh, uh, raise awareness and uh, conduct uh, community initiatives and campaign just to highlight some issues regarding to the child labor. The, uh, 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 the last layer time on working direct, directly with uh, stakeholders and uh, decision maker, uh, makers in Jordan just to make sure you know, we are trying our best to uh, change some, uh, uh, some laws and policies just to make sure you know, the policies in line with child protection standards. That's why uh, uh, in April in Jordan, we launched the uh, national strategy to reduce child labor 2023. Sorry, taking notes as you were talking, Sally, and you just finished, but um, thank you for sharing that. Very interesting. Um, I see in the chat there's a uh, question from uh, Ragda talking about uh, child labour is a serious problem in Lebanon, especially after the re recent financial crisis and increasing amongst the re refugee community. And as a result, Lebanese and refugee children are exploited to further exploitation. Um, Ruba, obviously you are there um, and, and have been working for a number of years. What are your thoughts? Do you think, have you seen, do you feel that child labor within Lebanon is increasing? 
do you think or see there are programs being done by government or how comprehensive do you think these schemes are like the one you are involved in with uh, tdh Yeah, we obtained that uh, a high increase in the child labor, especially uh, the street children, for which we obtained a lot, a high number of children that uh, work in the street, uh, and uh, some of these children has disabilities. It's not a bad one then, sorry. Um, Sandra as well, talking about children with disabilities, obviously with dealing with conflict, um, rehabilitation of CAFAG as well is similar with some uh, child labor. How can we make sure we're inclusive to those who do have physical challenges or others? Um, I'm assuming in a number of conflicts, there are those children and, and parents as well who have been damaged by the war physically, which then makes it harder either to find work or the social inclusion. Yeah, I think the very first thing is to identify them. And quite often they go really under the radar. So you have the children with physical disability, like where they have like a, maybe a crutch or, you know, in a wheelchair and that's very visible. And then we tend to focus on me on these children, you know, like make all these arrangements so that the physical space is accessible to these children. But there are all kinds of uh, impairments that are not necessarily visible. Um, and I'm thinking of children with hearing impairments, with sometimes visual impairments. They're not necessarily blind, but like they have uh, maybe more difficulties to see. And so the first thing is really to identify them, to screen them. So there are like great tools from the Washington group set of uh, questions. And uh, this is a series of five questions that will and it's specifically for children to help you identify first those children with these impairments and then adapt like the, the life skills activities, the livelihood programs to their to their needs. So we can adjust the visual aid, you know, sometimes with light or uh, we make sure they have access to um, uh, maybe hearing support, you know, if they have hearing impairment. So there's all there's a whole range of impairments, and and not only those who are uh, physical, you know, disabilities with their legs, for example. So that's maybe a point I'd like to make. Um, yes, and maybe a second point is to focus also on their rights. So when you do the life skills program, you can include like a specific session on how they can advocate for their own rights and ask for their rights to be protected. So like understanding what are the services they can access to and, and ask for them. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, Sandra. Sally, similar question to you, especially looking at it more from the livelihoods program. Uh, do you feel there's enough being done and is there work being done to ensure there's more inclusion in terms of child labor programming as well in uh, Jordan, for example? You're on mute at the moment, sorry. Sorry, Simon, can you repeat your question? I'm sorry. Yes, so it's about inclusion. So building on what Sandra was saying and Ruba was saying in terms of inclusion of those with disabilities or, or differences as in general within the programming on, on child labor in, uh, in Jordan or other examples you're aware of. Yes. Uh, uh, Simon, for us, we, 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 we make sure you know, to integrate uh, or to engage uh, children with disabilities because in Jordan we have you know, a huge number of children with, with disabilities. They are uh, not engaging of any education system. Uh, they, are, they have nothing. Uh, uh, you know, and some cases they are look like a homebound, uh, homebound girls and uh, uh, children with disabilities because of overprotection. That's why we have uh, specialized services uh, in Jordan with uh, different stakeholders. The, uh, the second thing, we engage them or we uh, we trying our best to engage them in uh, we have something we call plan to inclusify the program. Uh, this is uh, yani, uh, 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 how we're going to engage uh, children with disabilities in, in this uh, 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 programs just to make sure you know, 
they they received or they are in line with the minimum standard of mental health services in Jordan. Okay, thank you, Sally. Um, quickly, we are getting a lot of um, questions in the chat. For those of you who aren't um, posting in there and have questions, please do um, post your questions in the chat and we will try and include them. Uh, got an interesting one further up uh, asking, Ruba, it's so important for us adults to listen and learn from your experiences. I know that you were at the Kigali Global Gathering of Working Children in January with other working children from across the world. What for you was the most significant or important part of that experience? If you could share a little bit about that. Okay, one of my beautiful experience uh, with TDH is uh, traveling to Kigali, which is uh, one of the best and amazing challenge uh, to myself. Uh, and Kigali, there is a lot of beautiful thing uh, and uh, activity with uh, the global gathering for which we obtained uh, the uh, global gathering with uh, the child labor. So in uh, this conference, I uh, can able uh, to uh, meet a lot of uh, people that have uh, the same story as me. Uh, so these people uh, is uh, being identical to me inside out. And uh, this is a very beautiful thing. Uh, if uh, uh, it is a very beautiful thing in order to live uh, with the uh, with a people that is uh, like you. Um, also uh, in Kigali, there is uh, activity. Well, there is one activity that uh, I prefer the most, uh, which is uh, the uh, human library. This uh, library, I. Uh, I attend it in order to able to listen all the uh, all the story about uh, the children that work all over the world, for which I can able to know uh, what is the challenges and uh, what is the uh, main uh, cause behind the, the work of these children, either in uh, uh, Colombia, either in Africa, Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, etc. Uh, also, uh, this experience uh, allow us to know that uh, there is a lot of beautiful thing in the life uh, in uh, the presence of this beautiful thing uh, in uh, the conference. So never give up. Uh, uh, never give up. Uh, there is a lot of beautiful thing uh, that uh, uh, we still love. Uh, the conference is uh, a very beautiful experience to me and uh, many other fr uh, friends. Also, in this uh, conference uh, in Africa, I uh, know a lot. Uh, of the uh, friend, a lot of uh, traditions, a lot of uh, cultures, a lot of languages, and uh, able to build a lot of uh, friends uh, in all over the world. Excellent. Thank you, Ruba. Welcome. Okay, just looking at a couple of the questions coming in. Sandra, a bit more of an esoteric question for you. This is coming from me. So the theme this year for World Day Against Child Labour is social justice for all. Uh, and as we know, the theme for the Alliance Conference this year is the centrality of child protection um, in humanitarian action. So for you, thinking from the CAFAG side of you, thinking about what was discussed in the previous panel, looking at uh, um, what was discussed around Os in Oslo and everything else, what what does social justice mean for you in terms of CAFAG, child protection, child labour? And what would that really mean on the ground for you? Yeah. Nice, easy one. Yeah, exactly. Just like this. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so many things. Um, I think uh, the very first thing and that comes to mind is that with CAFAG, um, the, in some contexts, and particularly the context where, as I said earlier, they are considered as the enemy or they are associated with armed groups that are designated as terrorist organizations, for example. Um, in these contexts, children are rarely considered as victims. And then they, will, they are considered as perpetrators of violence, as criminals, or even as terrorists. And what we see is that they tend to be uh, considered as adults and then they go through a justice system that is made for adults, that is made for terrorist organizations, and then they don't recognize their status of victim from a legal perspective, at least. And that's, uh, that's really critical because we see a lot of situations where children were just 
maybe like the child of um, or the yeah the child of a, a terrorist, uh, but they haven't been engaged themselves, or they were just living in the wrong place where local authorities believe that most people in that area are supporting um, the terrorist organization. So we have a lot of situations where those children are where they are not associated with an armed group and then considered as adults. They're not going through the juvenile justice system. And then it's basically a denial of their rights. And that for me is really critical in a number of places in the, in the Middle East and in Africa as well. And um, that's the first step. And then the second one I would say is around, is working with the communities because what happens at the global level with the government is also reflected locally. So we see also community members rejecting these children because they are scared of them, because they fear they would you know, attack them. They don't want their girls to marry these this boys. They don't want their, um, their children to be friends with them. So it's like, it's a, when we think about those children, what they've been through already, you know, being sometimes kidnapped, um, going, you know, spending years in these armed groups, witnessing a lot of violence. And then when they finally out, they face a justice system that is not made for them. They see, they face rejection from their families, from their communities. So it's like a really comprehensive package of services that needs to be done at all level. It's not a, it's not a quick fix. And maybe, yeah, this is something that we actually mentioned during the Oslo conference that it takes time to support these children. And so, the, the funding mechanism, the, the whole structure needs to allow for this time for children to recover uh, from, the, from what they've been through. Excellent, thanks, Sandra. We were hoping um, to have someone from the donor community join this panel as well, but they were unable to join last minute. And I think the issue you brought up in terms of time, in terms of programming and ensuring that, that um, systems are in place to actually have a long-term uh, look at how to address these problems is definitely a uh, key which is often overlooked or despite people saying yes we need to do it doesn't actually necessarily happen on the ground. Um, Sally I wanted to pivot to you and, and build again on what Sandra was saying at the beginning there um, about those children associated with armed conflict are rarely seen as victims or seen as perpetrators and how the justice system fails them because they're put through as adults. And I think this is often very true within terms of child labor as well, and looking at how families of child laborers are treated as well. Um, and so it becomes a judicial issue rather than a social issue. Um, have you got either examples from Jordan or have you got updates possibly in terms of how um, there has been work done within the Ministry of Social Affairs and Ministry of Labour in Jordan to address this and try and stop this becoming such a uh, judicial issue and becoming more of an issue for social services. Come on, thank you, Simon. Actually, Yanni, as I mentioned before, uh, we are working in uh, different layers in Jordan, and this is what we are uh, trying just to uh, uh, to engage the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Labour, Ministry of Social Development, and Ministry of Youth as core ministries, uh, uh, and it's it's very important to let them responsible on the child labour. Uh, 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 sector in Jordan. That's why uh, yani, uh, through our uh, national uh, strategy to reduce child labor, we are uh, give them the responsibility and uh, we, we reflect the responsibilities on action on real action plan uh, just to uh, to make sure you know, uh, every single ministry uh, have uh, 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 direct uh, interventions uh, to children and parents just to make sure you know uh, the children for example uh, 
uh, they refer to the education system. That, that's why it's very important to work closely with uh, 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 formal education system and informal education. And on the other hand, we are working closely with the uh, Ministry of Youth just to uh, to make sure you know, there is uh, uh, livelihood opportunities for uh, uh, children from 16 to 18 because the uh, national law in Jordan uh, allowed the, uh, the children between 16 to 18 to engage in, uh, in work with uh, some limitations any we can talk it uh, or address it uh, later and uh, the other thing you know we are working directly with the uh, uh, mobic because it's very important and uh, at the end of the day when we are talking about the donors and the uh, 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 the fund uh, in jordan it's very important to to make sure you know uh, we are taking the child labor aspect or uh, issues uh, uh, into consideration just to make sure uh, yani, we are addressing the child or the worst forms of child labor and our uh, agreements with donors or uh, yani, uh, for more funding and uh, 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 more interventions. Excellent. And just quickly for those who are not familiar with the Jordanian context, could you say who MOPIC are and which ministry they are? Uh, ministry of uh, Social, uh, sorry, Ministry planning. of the Planning, uh, yeah. yeah, Ministry of the Planning. And so they are also very heavily involved with the refugee response and how that's all put together, correct? Definitely, definitely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, and, and actually, one last thing, yeah, and there is a lot of uh, interventions inside uh, uh, Azraq and uh, Zaatari refugee, Syrian refugee camps, because, uh, yeah, and, to be honest, there is a huge number of child labor cases inside the two camps. That's why we have a lot of interventions and a lot of uh, uh, work just to make sure you know uh, the children uh, they are received their uh, formal or informal educations and uh, MHPS services, and we are uh, uh, make sure you know they are uh, uh, safe and in in uh, safe environments. Excellent. Thanks, Sally. So yeah, uh, Ruby, you're answering in the chat as well. Someone's asked you a question about recommendations to address child labor and you've already in the chat put about advocacy, lobbying to, uh, to reduce child labor, safe spaces, drop-in services and education being a key. Um, I just wanted to know if there was, going back to the question on to Sandra as well, in terms of social justice, I think some of what's said is there, but in terms of social justice on, on World Day Against Child Labour, what would that look like to you? Or what do you think that looks like in terms of, of justice and, and protection for uh, child labourers? So uh, do you mean for child labour in general or for CAFAG? No, I'm saying through, did I say Sandra? Yeah. I meant Ruba, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry, Ruba, in terms of... Uh, answering the question on social justice as well for child laborers. Okay, about the, the social justice and uh, the protection. Uh, first of all, there is no uh, the social justice 100% attending for the social, social justice for the child labor in Lebanon, because uh, there is a lot of uh, rights that is uh, deprived from uh, as uh, a Palestinian refugees. Uh, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon is face uh, a very troubles and the problems uh, such as discrimination, uh, violence. As uh, so you obtained uh, that for the Palestinian refugees is uh, deprived from uh, the main right, which is learning. So it cannot able to learn. Uh, it cannot able to learn a lot of uh, things such as being doctor, uh, being. Uh, um, engineer being uh, any other things uh, cannot uh, able to being in uh, the Palestinian refugees so Palestinian refugees is uh, is deprived from uh, the right of being doctor and uh, engineer also uh, on the other field we obtained uh, that uh, the organization like TDH uh, play a vital role in order to make a uh, hundred uh, percent attending of the safe protection uh, and uh, being uh, being the trial 
child uh, safety and uh, reducing the child labor, such as uh, the child working in the streets, working in uh, many other places. So many organizations start uh, to form a social justice. And uh, one of the social justice that uh, must be attended in Lebanon is forming inequality between uh, girls and boys, inequality between the, uh, the person with different nationality. Uh, we obtained equality between uh, Lebanese people and Palestinian people and Syrian people in uh, Lebanon that is uh, lack uh, too much in Lebanon. So we obtained that the organization uh, such as TTH start uh, to work more and more in order to make uh, this being true, uh, in order to form uh, uh, an equality between uh, the nationality, Palestinian people, uh, Syrian people, Lebanese people, also to prevent discrimination between girls or boys, between Palestinian refugees, between Syrian refugees, between uh, Lebanese people and many other nationalities. So we obtained that uh, last time uh, the uh, the percent of uh, formation of a safer protection and uh, social justice is increases due to the uh, vital role of organization in uh, this field. Excellent. Thank you for that. And it's good looking to uh, address issues around equality and discrimination and, and there's actual practical examples you've given. Thank you so much for that. Um, Saleh, just to ask you as well, final question in terms of, we've asked Sandra and we've asked Ruben now in terms of what social justice would look like to them in terms of child labour or child protection. What about you? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah, and for me, social justice in regard to child protection and child labour would involve ensuring that children have access to their basic rights including education, healthcare, and the protection from violence, exploitation, and abuse. And yani, this is what involves creating policies uh, and system uh, that prioritize well-being of children and working to address the roots causes of child labor and abuse, yani, uh, such as uh, poverty and in, uh, inequality. Uh, for me, yani, social justice was, uh, uh, would uh, also involve empowering communities and families and working with parents, uh, community, just to make sure uh, from uh, 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 or to ensure that uh, children are able to participate in their decisions to uh, affect their lives. Uh, and actually social justice uh, for uh, children means creating uh, a world where uh, very child can grow up and uh, uh, grow up safely, uh, healthy, and free to uh, reach their uh, full potential. Uh, yani one last thing in Jordan, we are, uh, yani as I mentioned uh, in the first uh, question, uh, Simon, we are try, uh, trying our best to work with the holistic approach just to make sure you know, we are targeting uh, the main roots of uh, child labor and to make sure you know, every single uh, organization or an institution uh, are taking part. And for me, this is the very important point to give uh, the, uh, uh, the responsibility to the community, to the parents, to the government, just to, to make sure you know, they are in line with uh, the, minimum, the minimum standard of child protection in general. That's why it's very important to, uh, to mention يعني, uh, at the end of the day, because يعني, some donors and uh, some organization, they are not prioritize the uh, child labor as يعني, uh, uh, a big uh, challenge or big uh, issue uh, or big protection issue. That's why يعني, uh, uh, يعني, there is a lot of impact really uh, to, uh, uh, يعني, as Ruba mentioned, uh, يعني, children يعني, they faced a lot especially uh, the younger children they cannot express about if they faced any sexual harassment or uh, abuse يعني, they cannot mention or uh, offer uh, 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 what happened with them no thank you completely um we've got about five ten minutes left to wrap up so i just want to point everyone that further up in the chat Seleke so has um, re-posted um, the Menti link. Um, if you could have a look there, again, this is going back to what does social justice, so please feel free to uh, click on the Menti link and add there. I also see that uh, Sandra 
has uh, added those who are interested in CAFAG in the issue of children and armed conflict. There's the community of practice um, specifically focusing on CAFAG, so please feel free to join there. There is also a um, group on child labour within this Change Makers for Children as well, so also please um, join on there. Um, but as uh, everyone starts typing in the answers to the Menti, um, let me go back to you, Sandra, and um, your thoughts and wrap ups. If you've just got a few words or one thing that you would like the audience to take away from this session uh, and the issues that we've discussed, what would they be? Uh, you're on mute, Sandra. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, so many things. I think um, this issue of considering children as victims is really key to me because um, it has a lot of implications in terms of access to services, you know, respecting their rights, um, also for uh, organizations to work with them, for the government to acknowledge what they've been through, for the communities then also to acknowledge um, the, the experiences that they, they've been through. So I think that it has a lot of replication effects. If the government doesn't consider those children as victims, then the rest of the country won't. And then, you know, we can provide like all the services that we want, like if they're not accepted in their communities and their families, like it's going to be very, uh, very difficult. So I think that work is, um, it's a lot of advocacy to governments is to really push for the respect of international law. Um, we have global instruments like the OPAC, for example, even the Convention on the Right of the Child as well. Like these are instruments that protect children from being treated as adults and, and, and as perpetrators of violence. Excellent. And then if you don't mind me adding something to what you've just said as well, as well as making sure children are treated as victims. I think we need to remember that children are children and should not be treated in the same way as adults are exposed to say adult justice or even adult forms of work. Uh, and again, to that children are entitled to a childhood, which includes education and play uh, and downtime to be children. Um, so uh, sorry to uh, yeah, jump it, in, but I thought it was very close to what you were saying exactly, as well. Exactly, no, no, that compliments it well. Excellent. Sally, you as well, your uh, final uh, takeaway points. Yani, for me, yani, it's very important to unify the national efforts and uh, leave no one behind. You have to uh, work with uh, in a very difficult uh, context. Uh, that's why it's very important to mention yani, uh, one hand cannot clap. So you have to engage every single institute, local organizations, uh, INGOs, UN, uh, UN uh, organizations, and government just to uh, to uh, uh, yani, to conduct a holistic approach of interventions to uh, solve the uh, uh, child labor uh, issues in your country. And it's, it's very important to learn from the uh, 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 similar context if they have any uh, best practice, practices and to share, to share uh, knowledge and resources just because yani, at the end of the day, we can benefit from each other, especially uh, uh, because we are in uh, a similar and um, or one word so please feel free to share uh, any useful information or uh, uh, resources you uh, can benefit uh, from anybody here excellent thank you sally i think throughout your uh, answers you've you've really rammed home the message in terms of holistic thinking and approaches and looking how this all does link together so that's been uh, excellent and then um finally i think ruba you deserve the uh, final voice on the uh, panel to give your experiences and your thoughts on this. And what are your take home message for the rest of us? Okay, from here, I uh, advocate for free education and uh, protection services. Uh, and uh, every day there is a lesson, even if it's good or bad, but uh, don't forget that uh, as long as uh, you are breathing, like, uh, like uh, live uh, it with a smile. 
And uh, when I attend the global gathering, which is the most best experience and the challenge for me, uh, that uh, built my self-confidence and let me to know more story and met a person like me inside out and uh, discover that, that the life is still best in the presence of this person. And uh, I'm proud of myself uh, and not worried for telling my story from uh, for uh, the whole world in uh, my real name. Uh, always remember that uh, never give up. Uh, there is a lot of a beautiful thing waiting you and uh, uh, the God things need uh, a hard working to reach it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruba. I think that's a great way to finish as well. But also, I think for all of you who've been participating, asking questions and listening in, thank you so much. And, and just to show, this is what social justice means to you as well. So you've heard from our three panelists, but now you can also see what all of you think in terms of vulnerabilities, activities, equal social support, participation, um, children's protection, um, non-exploitation, the role of the community, elimination of the worst forms of child labor, strong policies. So thank you so much for all of these. Um, two more things, I will highlight again, Sandra's call for you to uh, join the community of practice for CAFAG. And also I believe you have another uh, CAFAG session later in the week. Um, so please join that if you are interested. Um, myself and Elenia have the Child Labour Task Force meeting on Wednesday as well. So please look to join um, if you are interested in the topic and, and you've been uh, inspired by the uh, discussion uh, we've been having here. Um, so thank you very much for all of you staying to the end and participating so well in this. Um, I'm not sure if I'm handing over to Camilla or Julie, because I believe there's a couple of other slides and, and final points as well. We'll hear from Hani first and then, and then from me, but thank you Go so ahead. much, Simon. Hani, thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, Elenia and all the panelists. Great. So just uh, thought we'll do a quick recap of the day and, and tell you a little bit about what will come ne uh, next, which is the networking session, and tomorrow. Um, so just a few reflections uh, from the day. First of all, it was okay. there was a resounding recognition of how important and beautiful it was for us to have children with us uh, in, in this forum. And, and the courage of these children, including Ruba, Akorede, Jessis, who, who really um, kind of brought to bear some of the points that we are trying to, to discuss and tackle. Uh, so really thanks uh, to all of the children who have been with us and those that facilitated their, their participation. Um, it was very interesting to us how active the chat was, uh, especially when certain topics came up like child participation, like localization. Uh, the chat was, uh, was bursting at the seams, if that's the right expression to use here. Um, it was, uh, it was a, very, a very active participation, even though we're not together in, in one room uh, physically. Just quickly going through some of the some of the elements of the day. In the opening, um, we had Tasha and Daniel uh, talk about the importance of this space, of really kind of taking that step back and 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 reflecting on so many so many issues that that affect children, and affect our sector that is uh, supposed to to um, to provide the care and protection that children need. We talked about the timeline of uh, an evolution of our sector. Um, speakers talked about um first of all it was really interesting to see how some uh some colleagues who have been part of the sector for many years some of the caring leaders came together and really reflected and it's it was recognized as, a, as an important exercise for us to to hear from these leaders who have been part of the sector either before or currently uh to reflect with us on where we have come from and where we're going um they, they spoke to some of the challenges in terms of the, the life-saving nature of, of the child protection sector, the complexity of our sector, but they also talked about how important it is and has been for us to recognize the importance of systems building and, and some really powerful messages uh, in terms of localization and, and true localization, I, I would rather say. Um, the next session, which was on centrality of children and their protection, it's, uh, we, we have seen a big step from when we launched the, the Alliance uh, strategy two, two and a half years ago to now when centrality of children under protection is really a concept that is being picked up and, and, and embraced by the 
broader uh, community, not just child protection individual uh, child protection actors. Um, we had we heard a very strong message of accountability, holding ourselves and the decision ma makers accountable to protection of children, using very clear indicators. Uh, just quickly on the Oslo conference, it was highlighted how important it is to keep the momentum uh, on on this issue of of children affected by armed conflict, um, and talking about compact for impact and much more. And on child labor, again, a huge thanks to, to all of you. We just finished that session. Uh, Ruba, thank you very much for being with us and, and being so courageous and, and, uh, and strong and giving us the message of hope and to other children. Um, thank you. And so we, we, with this, we wanted to celebrate the resilience of, and power of children that are involved in labor and recommit ourselves to, to ending uh, child labor, especially worst forms of child labor uh, from our world. Thank you, everyone.